Hello, this is Eric again, and today I'll be continuing the subset of videos on tachyarrhythmias with a discussion of how to identify almost any tachyarrhythmia with six easy questions. I say almost because there are a handful of uncommon rhythms which require a lot of background and training to accurately identify, such as the specific forms of supraventricular tachycardia. However, after this video, you should be able to identify the overwhelming majority of these arrhythmias. To very briefly review from the last video, here are the six basic types of tachyarrhythmias. Sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, which we are considering at this point as one entity, even though we should acknowledge that it actually includes numerous other more specific diagnoses, most notable of which are things called AVNRT, AVRT, and atrial tachycardia. And finally, ventricular tachycardia, which can be easily subdivided into monomorphic and polymorphic subtypes. The six questions will allow you to place any tachyarrhythmia into one of these types with 99% certainty. So what are the important questions? Question one. What is the rhythm's rate? Question two, what is the regularity? Number three, is the QRS complex narrow or wide? Number four, what is the atrial activity? Number five, what is the relationship of P waves to QRS complexes? And finally, a two-part question, is the onset of the rhythm abrupt or gradual? And does the rate vary? I'll discuss the significance of each question one at a time. Regarding the rate, most tachyarrhythmias have largely overlapping possible rates, limiting the usefulness of this characteristic in general. However, there are a few observations or possible exceptions. First, the maximal predicted sinus rate is approximately 220 minus the person's age in years. This is not an absolute rule. World-class elite athletes can violate it, for example. However, if you encounter an 80-year-old man with a heart rate of 170, you can say with complete confidence without knowing anything else that the patient does not have sinus tachycardia. Next, a ventricular rate of exactly 150 is suggestive of atrial flutter with 2 to 1 AV block. Certainly other rhythms can have rates of 150, and as discussed in the last video, the ventricular rate in atrial flutter can be almost anything. However, it is surprising how often in practice that an unknown arrhythmia with a rate of exactly 150 turns out to be a flutter. The third observation is that most SVTs have rates of 150 to 200 beats per minute. While it's possible that an arrhythmia at 120 or 130 is due to a particularly unusual SVT, especially in patients on antiarrhythmics, this is not common. And the last, Multifocal atrial tachycardia is almost always less than about 160. Moving on to question two, is the rhythm regular, regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular? While regularly irregular bradyarrhythmias, particularly type 1 second degree AV block, are not rare, regularly irregular tachyarrhythmias are rare. The only two examples are atrial flutter with variable but consistently variable AV block, for example, the 2 to 1 alternating with 4 to 1 pattern mentioned in the last video. The other example is any SVT superimposed on type 1 second degree AV block. Regarding irregularly irregular tachyarrhythmias, there are only four, AFib, A flutter with inconsistently variable AV block, MAT, and polymorphic VT. If you see an irregularly irregular tachyarrhythmia, it does not matter whether or not the QRS is wide or narrow, or whether you see the P waves or not, you can be almost certain the rhythm is one of these. The only alternative, which is not listed here because it's not a true tachyarrhythmia in the same sense as the others, would be something like sinus tachycardia on which is superimposed frequent premature beats. This type of pattern is usually only seen in patients with significant cardiac disease or profound electrolyte abnormalities. Question three, are the QRS complexes narrow or wide? A narrow QRS complex, that is one that is less than 120 milliseconds in duration, 
excludes VT. A wide QRS complex, on the other hand, can be consistent with either VT or with any other rhythm with the addition of aberrant conduction, such as bundle branch block, pre-excitation, meaning an accessory conductive pathway between the atria and ventricles, concurrent use of class 1A or class 1C antiarrhythmics, or profound hyperkalemia. Question four, what is the atrial activity? There are a number of different parts to this question. First, are there P waves at all? And if so, are they the same morphology as when the patient is in normal sinus rhythm, assuming a baseline EKG is available? If the P waves look the same, it is highly likely, though not definitive, that the patient has sinus tachycardia. If the P waves are retrograde in morphology, meaning they are downgoing in lead 2 and or upright in lead AVR, it strongly suggests an SVT. Obviously, the presence of sawtooth flutter waves is indicative of flutter. Remember that flutter waves are best seen in the inferior leads, and rapid atrial activity is also often seen well in V1. And finally, if there is no discernible atrial activity, and the ventricular rhythm is irregular, it suggests AFib. No discernible atrial activity and a regular rhythm suggests either SVT or VT. Question 5. What is the relationship of P waves to QRS complexes? For example, do the P waves come before or after the QRS? If the P waves come after, it is highly suggestive of an SVT. Also, is there evidence of AV dissociation, fusion beats, or capture beats? Any of the above means the rhythm is almost certainly VT. And the last of the six questions, which is the two-parter, is the onset abrupt or gradual, and is there any variation of rate? Here's a graph of heart rate as a function of time. As shown here, a very abrupt onset without rate variation during the arrhythmia is consistent with atrial flutter, SVT, or VT. Whereas a very abrupt onset with rate variation is consistent with a fib, a flutter with variable block, or MAT. A gradual onset of the rhythm, and by gradual I mean over anywhere from 10 seconds to hours, is highly suggestive of sinus tachycardia, though this also could be from atrial tachycardia, something called junctional tachycardia, or ventricular tachycardia, but only if the mechanism driving the rhythm is enhanced automaticity. So those are the six questions. These questions are individually very easy to answer, but when used collectively, can give you the ability to diagnose complicated tachyarrhythmias that would otherwise be very difficult were you to use the more common pattern recognition strategy. There is one more aspect to making an accurate diagnosis to review, the diagnostic use of vagal maneuvers and a medication called adenosine. A vagal maneuver is any physical maneuver which transiently alters a patient's physiology in such a way as to increase parasympathetic output through the vagal nerve. This includes the Valsalva maneuver in which a patient is given some instruction that results in a forceful attempt at exhaling against a closed airway. In the U.S., the most common instruction I've heard a physician give is something along the lines of asking the patient to, quote, bear down. I don't find that particular phrasing to be helpful in getting patients to understand what exactly I want them to do. Instead, I like to take a clean, unused syringe without a needle attached, depress the plunger completely, and ask the patient to put their lips around the end and attempt as hard as they can to blow the plunger out. Of course, this task is impossible, but if maximum effort is really given, it will produce the same results as a traditionally performed Valsalva maneuver. Another example of a vagal maneuver is carotid sinus massage, in which the examiner firmly depresses the neck at the point of the carotid bifurcation, which is the location of the peripheral barrel receptors. Never do both sides simultaneously, and only depress for a few moments at a time in order to reduce risk of neurologic injury. A third maneuver, which is rarely employed clinically, is cold water immersion of the face, which creates something called a diving reflex, in which automaticity at the sinus node dramatically lowers, 
and the AV conduction time dramatically lengthens. As far as adenosine is concerned, it's a very short-acting intravenous medication which blocks AV conduction. Its duration of action is measured in seconds. As both vagal maneuvers and adenosine can transiently block AV conduction, they can be very helpful in diagnosing regular, narrow complex tachyarrhythmias. For example, either may stop AV conduction long enough to see underlying P waves or flutter waves, helping to diagnose atrial tachycardia and atrial flutter. Alternatively, they may abruptly terminate the rhythm, which not only treats the patient, it also strongly suggests a reentrant mechanism utilizing the AV node, for example, AVNRT or AVRT. However, a small percentage of atrial tachycardias are also adenosine sensitive. Here's what those situations look like on EKG. In the first example, a patient is in a narrow complex tachyarrhythmia at a rate of 150. The treating physicians felt that the EKG baseline had a sawtooth appearance suggesting atrial flutter, but to confirm, several seconds of carotid sinus massage were performed, which very briefly increased AV block and thus decreased the frequency of QRS complexes to the point where the flutter waves were unambiguous. There is essentially no risk that the carotid sinus massage will terminate atrial flutter, since the reentrant circuit responsible for flutter does not pass through the AV node. In this second example, another patient also had a narrow complex tachyarrhythmia which was not affected by vagal maneuvers. Therefore, 6 mg of adenosine was given. Note that the arrhythmia abruptly terminates, followed by a significant pause in the rhythm before normal sinus rhythm is re-established by the end of the strip. There are a couple of other interesting features of the strip. First, notice that there is a delay before the sinus P waves restart after the arrhythmia is terminated. This transient delay is due to something called overdrive suppression, which will be discussed in a video in the advanced EKG series. And then once the sinus node restarts and we see P waves, we still don't have any AV conduction since the AV node is blocked for about five seconds. Thus, the unusual wide QRS complex in the middle of the strip is something called an escape beat due to normal automaticity present in a latent pacemaker within the ventricles. The bump in that beat's deeply inverted T wave is a dissociated P wave. The consequence of the administration of adenosine is that not only is the arrhythmia stopped, but the clinician is also able to conclude that the patient's initial rhythm was an SVT, most likely AVNRT or AVRT. For reasons that are critical to both diagnostic assessment as well as patient safety, adenosine should only be used while a patient is closely monitored on telemetry, preferably with the rhythm actively recorded on a 12-lead rhythm strip, and a crash cart should be nearby. That's it for my approach to diagnosing tachyarrhythmias with six easy questions. I hope you found the approach helpful. The next video in this series will be a slightly different format. There will be no didactic dissemination of information. Instead, I'll show EKGs of 10 unknown tachyarrhythmias with a chance for you to deduce the diagnosis of each using the skills learned from this video before I review the explanation.